human heart. Just in the first five books of the Bible, there's Jesus. That's why you cannot unhinge the Old Testament from the New. It is connected. It is one. And to understand the new, man, you got to take a look at the old. So it's clear, very clear, especially when studying the old, we have no access to the righteousness of God through the law, but through faith. That's how we have access to the righteousness of God. In verse 22, you see it right there. Take note of this. Very important if you're taking note. And very important that you have a Bible. If you don't have one, we'll get you one. Faith is the instrument, not the ground or basis of our justification. Faith is the instrument, not the ground or basis for our justification. We're going to unpack that a little bit. What do I mean? What are the grounds for our justification? What are the grounds before you and me to stand right before a holy God? is Jesus' perfect obedience to the law. This is important. He didn't simply come to die. We think about Jesus that, oh yeah, He was with the Father and the, and the Spirit, and He just came down from heaven and died on the cross and went right back up. No, no, no. He lived a perfect righteous life. That is critical to the gospel message. That he was righteous in every way. That he followed the law in every way. That there was no sin upon him. And in that perfection, in that obedience to the law, he demonstrated that he was the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice. Did you catch that? He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the very righteousness of God. And faith is the instrument that we're all familiar with in the solas. Any good Presbyterians or Reformed or others know the solas, one of which is sola fide, by faith alone. Now, the Catholic Church would agree that faith is central to believing. But they would disagree by that word alone. And that's why the solas were so powerful, and the Reformation 500 years ago was so powerful, because Martin Luther and others declared to the church and became, they got kicked out essentially, but they said, no, no, it's not by faith plus sacrament penance, doing works, doing things. No, no, faith alone, by grace alone, through Jesus alone, by the word of God alone, for the glory of God alone. Amen. Alone. It's not the authority of the Bible plus the tradition of the church. Not the authority of the Bible plus the, the, the authority of the priest or the Pope. It is the authority of Scripture alone that guides us. Which is why I always say, if I say something that doesn't match up with here, what's, what's written, you pull me aside and you rebuke me strongly. Strongly, That's right. I open myself up for it. Because it's that important that the Word of God is clearly taught and we are faithful to it. Not adding to it, not changing it, not twisting it, not making it what we wanted to say, but truly preaching it through, verse by verse, precept by precept, book by book. But it's not just our faith that brings us out of condemnation. See, we need Jesus. We can have faith all day long. But what's the object of that faith? What, what is the substance of that faith? Well, we need Jesus to do two things for us. We need these things. We need, number one, His perfect righteousness. And we need His payment for sin. And that's the word atonement on the cross. His payment for our sin. The Bible says the wages of sin are death. We've earned death by our sin. But Jesus, being the mediator, went before us, stood before us, suffered and bore the wrath of God on the cross and pleased the Father. 
and paid the price and paid the payment and atoned for us. So number one, his perfect righteousness. Number two, his payment for our sin. Atonement on the cross. That's what we need. That's what we trust in as believers. Look at verse 24. We are justified. We are made right by the grace of God as a gift. Ephesians talks about the fact that there's no one that can boast that the, 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 the gift of grace is, is a gift. I don't stand boasting in the fact that I'm somewhat more special than you or you're more special than me. No, it's by the grace of God alone. And I'm not sure how we get this mentality that God owns us, owes us something. I think it's because we're stuck in this religious mindset that if we do these things, if we do these good works, then it's just fair that God would you know, look over our sin and, and accept us and be gracious to us. And we looked at that last time or a couple times before that we take advantage of the grace of God as we don't see the judgment of God against us and we continue in our sin, taking for granted what He has given to us. But we say, come on, man. I mean, I'm doing the best I can. Why don't you just give me a break, Lord? All right, hold on a second. I think maybe we give ourselves a little bit too much credit. Your sin. How do you view your sin? Is it a low view? That's not a big deal. Or is it a high view? Now, I'm more sinful than I really care to admit right now or ever. Or how about your view of God? Is it a low view? You know, God won't count his, my sins against me. You know, he's a nice, loving God, sort of warm and fuzzy, real kind. He is kind. But do you have a high view of God? Well, God is holy and must punish sin. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. Where do you stand? Maybe it's one side, maybe the other, maybe somewhere in between. It's always my goal to try to get us to a higher view of God. Let's get our view higher, lift our hearts higher to, to see and, and, and adore the grace of God toward us. It's what we talked about last time. So we have to remind ourselves that the grace of God is just that. It's grace that we don't observe, deserve. And yet, He freely gives it to us because... There's not anything special, not because of that. He simply gives grace because he wants to. And our response, well, I think it should be one of more of a wonder. Why would a holy God be gracious to me, a sinner? What merit, what have I done to deserve this? Nothing. Right, we, we've done nothing. And because verse 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all. That means you, that means me. That means religious, that means non-religious. That means pagan, that means all, all, all. And the consequence of sin is where man has exchanged the glory of God for idolatry. We've distorted the divine image that we were made in the image of God and we've corrupted it and we've said no gender, no image, no broken. We, we are whatever we want to be, whatever we are for the moment. We are morally and spiritually corrupted. But God gives us grace to us that we can be restored to Him and that we can be changed and be made more and more like Jesus. taking us back into His kingdom and His glory, showing us that we've been bought with a price. So glorify God with your body, with our lives. And this is all because of Jesus. So this is our justification. Number one, being made right before a holy God. Because the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, having perfect righteousness of His own, live that way, and we by faith now inherit that righteousness. You see, that's the whole point of it. 
His righteousness becomes our righteousness. It's imputed to us. It's in our account. It's open up your bank account. There's the righteousness of Jesus fully there. That's what you've been given. That's what you receive as you have been justified, declared righteous. Not because you have anything, but because of what He's done for you. Amen. The second we see in the text is redemption. We love that. Redemption. Redemption. If you look up that word, it means to buy back or to get back. It also means to, to be free from captivity of, by payment of a ransom. Think about your life before you knew Jesus. How would you describe it? Would you describe it as being free? How come you weren't? As it relates to sin, what's our state of being without Jesus? We're captives to sin, captives to darkness, captives to selfishness, to hatred, to wickedness, to evil. You say, oh, it's not, I'm not that bad. I guess you haven't really <laughs> taken a good, honest inventory. Consider the justification that we have in Christ. Through, that is through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this is literally what it means, this word redemption, quoting from the Bible dictionary. Deliverance affected through the death of Christ from the retributive wrath of a holy God and the merited penalty of sin. In other words... Jesus did for us by being the perfect sacrifice to save us from God's wrath. That's right. He saved us from God. Jesus saved us from the penalty that we deserve for our sin. Jesus redeemed us from death, from darkness, and he brought us into his marvelous light. He freed us from guilt. I remember waking up in the morning years ago before being a Christian and being swallowed in guilt, swallowed in regret, in regret, and an overwhelming sense of darkness and painfulness and despair. But once I was purchased back, redeemed by Jesus, something happened. I didn't feel that weight of the guilt anymore. I was forgiven of all my sin, past and present and future. Hallelujah. So, I've been justified. I've been redeemed by Jesus. Another word here in verse 25 is this word propitiation. It's a big one. Don't get intimidated by it. But it's the same word in the, used in the Septuagint, which is the Latin in the Old Testament. It comes from Exodus 25 and 22. Again, we don't unhinge from the Old Testament. And on this mercy seat from Exodus 25 and verse 22, this mercy seat, same word, sprinkled with the blood of an animal, the sacrifice. It was served to appease God as the sins of the people were expiated, another one, or atoned for or paid for until the next day of annual atonement. You see in the scriptures, in verse 25, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, that's what he did every year, Offer the sacrifice, although the animal was blemished and not perfect, couldn't be. They tried. God was, would say, all right, just to uphold my righteousness, you offer that sacrifice and it will appease a holy God. And then next year we'll do it again. And next year we'll do it again. And the Jews look forward to the Messiah because they could say once and for all, done with this annual atonement. Jesus is our atonement. Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus is the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And that's what we have today. The privilege of a Christian to know the Messiah who was promised from thousands of years ago that the Jews look forward to. He has come and we can be forgiven. 
And all He asks for us is just, by faith, receive what He's done on the cross, what He's accomplished for you and for me. You couldn't get more gracious than that. You really can. So as Jesus propitiated our sin by His blood, you see that? By His blood. You know, there's life in the blood. Without blood, not to get all gross with you, but without blood, there's no life. Nothing can live that is like you or me or an animal, certainly a tree or whatever plant, but nothing that can live as we know it without blood. And Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So you see, the propitiation is the satisfying of God. The satisfying of God, of His wrath, being satisfied for us, the blood. That's what does it. The blood that was poured out by Jesus for our forgiveness. That's what they did on the altar, and the Jews did, offered the animal sacrifice, sprinkled the blood of the mercy seat. Jesus' blood poured out on the cross, the perfect sacrifice, propitiated, satisfied the wrath of God. The wrath of God is deserved to us. It's our penalty that, for the unbeliever, the wrath of God rests upon Everyone that does not put their faith and trust in Jesus has the wrath of God reserved for them. That's the hard reality of what we're dealing with, of what is a difficult thing to tell someone. I certainly wouldn't open up in conversation. Hey, can I share something with you? Yeah, what's up? The wrath of God is resting on you. Okay, back up. Not ready. Not ready for that. But what are we without truth, anyway? What are we just being comfortable people on, on our way to eternal conscious separation from God? What do we have? It's the truth and the truth alone that will set us free. So 1 John, if you want to take note, 1 John 2 and verse 2 also talks about propitiation, the satisfying of, of the wrath of God. It says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's amazing what Jesus did on the cross, and that it was effective to forgive and cleanse from all of your sin. Past, present, and future. Imagine the weight of that, the sins of the world upon Jesus, and then for Him to declare to all in hearing, his, hearing Him, it is finished. It is done. We don't put Jesus up on the cross every Sunday because He finished. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. He rose again. He defeated death. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and He's coming back to judge. And now we who were once far off have been brought near, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 13, by the blood of Jesus Christ, as God has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9. He's brought us near. We have access to the Holy of Holies. The, the, the access from the, to the temple has been torn. The curtain from top to bottom, symbolizing the fact that no work of man, because he could only bring, tear open from bottom to top. Jesus has made a way. He's made an access for us, that we can find mercy and grace in our time of need, that he is near us, that he has drawn us. And it's a mystery, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1 and 9. So what Jesus did in His blood was to appease, that's that propitiation, to appease the wrath of God. To satisfy God's just judgment against sin. Poured out on the cross, and Jesus cried out, It is finished. He announced to the world that it was done, that it was complete, that we can add nothing to it, praise God, but simply rest in it. How many of you want to rest in Jesus? Rest in the promises of God today, you weary one. 
It's the work of Christ. God is shown as both the just and the justifier in verse 26, if, if you're following along. He's both just and the justifier. There is no grounds of accusation against God. You cannot say to God, oh, you're not just, you're not right. No, no, he's, he is just, and he's the one that's justifier, is the justifier. He's the one that brings us our justification in the finished work of Christ. That's how he is just and the justifier. That he would declare over us our justification, our righteousness. And then the tool, the tool or the instrument through which that's made possible, how do we access that? Is faith. Through faith alone, by the grace alone, by the word of God alone, through Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. So according to verse 27, are there any grounds for us to boast? No. No. In Christ alone, by faith alone. God is the, both, God, is the God of, of both the Jew and the Gentile, the creator over all that is, all that was and all that is to come. The Jews were not particularly special, be, that special because they were given the law, they, somehow that they could find justification through the law. No, God is one, the Apostle Paul says. He says there's one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see as he closes out in verse 31, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Do we cast it away? He says, no. By no means. Exclamation point. On the contrary, we uphold the law. It's the, this grace through Jesus Christ that fulfills the law, that shows the law in its glory, and that as we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we too can have peace with God. So our justification, our being made right before a holy God, is through faith. It's the reality of every believer, as they have been, and we, have been declared righteous before a holy God. Declared righteous before a holy God. Just in a courtroom. Murderer, thief, adulterer, whatever it is, committed all kinds of, of law-breaking. The judge, not guilty. Jesus says, I'll take the punishment. He bears the guilt so that you can be declared not guilty. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But we can enjoy the declared righteousness over our lives. That we can know that we know that we know our relationship with God has been restored and we're going to heaven. We don't have to get caught in religious systems. Sit down, stand up, give this amount. It'll be given back to you, shaking down, tossed up, and all that junk. Forgive me. But we trust in the grace of God. We trust in God himself for what he's done, not what we've done, what he's done. And that is what changes us from the inside out. This mystery of being not guilty. Through the redemption, purchased blood of Jesus Christ, we've been bought with a price, we've been rescued from the kingdom of darkness, and delivered into the kingdom of his, of his light. So through this propitiation, through this satisfying of God's wrath in Jesus' blood, we no longer have a hopeless vanity, Am I going to heaven? Can my relationship be made right? We no longer get caught in the religious ritual and the activity, hoping, hoping that our good works will outweigh the bad. We simply come to Jesus, enjoy his blessed assurance, realizing that we are heirs of salvation, purchased of God. Let's pray together, and I'll invite Ray to lead us in the song, Blessed Assurance. So, Father, we're glad that you're with us. We're glad that your grace is sufficient, made perfect in our weakness. 
We have nothing to bring, but simply to the cross we cling. We have no righteousness of our own, no holiness of our own. We simply come to you, Jesus, by faith alone and receive from you alone your grace. So remind us of that reality this day. Send us with your peace. Fill us with your joy. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and worship the Lord. Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever 